evening and welcome to Central News. For Wednesday the 4th of December, I'm Harriet Wilson. In today's news, infants are at increased risk of falling prey to the national whooping cough epidemic as families gather to celebrate Christmas. During this high-risk period, Waikato DHB urges pregnant women in the Waikato region to make the most of the Ministry of Health's free whooping cough immunisation for women 28 to 38 weeks pregnant. The vaccine reduces the risk of the pregnant mother contracting whooping cough and can help protect the baby for at least the first six weeks of life through antibodies passed through the placenta and through breast milk. 70% of babies contract whooping cough from household contact. A comprehensive monitoring report into the effects of oil pollution from the grounding of the MV Rena on Astrolab Reef in 2011 shows few long-lasting impacts on Bay of Plenty maritime habitats. However, the environment has not yet returned to its pre-Rena state, the report says. The 460-page report, which covers the first two years of ongoing survey and research work, details one of the most comprehensive multidisciplinary studies ever undertaken in response to a marine pollution incident. University of Waikato Chair and Coastal Science Professor Chris Battershill said initial concerns that oil would have a long-lasting and negative impact on beaches and fisheries could mostly be put to rest. The monitoring is part of the government's 2.4 million RENA long-term environmental recovery plan. Now for our region's weather. That beautiful fine weather has come to an end this week as Hamilton your Thursday will bring rain and northeasterly breezes. It's still warm though with a high of 23 and an overnight low of 16. Tauranga much the same for you tomorrow with heavy falls developing. Your expected high is 22 with an overnight low of 18. Just ahead, if you saw adults carrying around cardboard cutouts on Buddy Day last month, we explain what it was all about. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. Buddy Day was held on the 18th of November and saw adults and celebrities from all over New Zealand carry their cardboard buddies around with them for the day. The day aims to get people talking about child abuse, which is often something that no one wants to talk about. This is the second part of my interview with Buddy Day manager Janine Evans, learning more about the day. So why did your team see a need for Buddy Day in New Zealand? New Zealand has shocking child abuse statistics and um, at last the research showed we were a five, fifth in the OECD. Last year approximately 21,000 confirmed cases of child abuse which that works out at about 60 children a day, um, which is, is shocking. So in order to change um, a problem, you need to start talking about it. Um, hence Buddy Day is about initiating conversations about the wellbeing of children. And how many centres are involved across the country? This year um, we had four involved. We started off, this was the third year in Hamilton, first year Tauranga, Central Auckland and Wellington. And we had over um, 1,200 people involved across those locations. Just how important is the involvement of adults in this day? Buddy Day is an adult event and we need to be clear about that. Um, children can't stop child abuse, only adults can. So it is really important that we create the dialogue around this issue and um, all take responsibility for the role we have in keeping children safe. How can people make sure that the messages that Buddy Day promotes continue year round? These conversations are not just for one day, they are for uh, all year round. So we, as we are going about our everyday lives we need to just remember that if we do have concerns about a child and we need to tr trust our gut feelings, uh, we need to actually do something and we have um, information on our website, the Child Matters website, that you can, which has links. Um, and information on what to do and where to go if you do have concerns about a child. I think too it's about, um, it's not just our own children that we have responsibility for, we have responsibility for the children in our, in our communities and neighbourhoods. So if we're at the supermarket, if we're at a sports game, if we're out and about and um, we 
see something we're not comfortable with, we actually, it is our business to do something. Now can you tell us a little bit more about Child Matters and I guess what their involvement is with Buddy Day and what they are involved with the rest of the year? Child Matters specialises in educating and training in child protection. Uh, we, Buddy Day is one of our initiatives and that is our public awareness initiative. We have um, another, a number of areas um, that we work in um, around our core business training. Uh, we run NZQA training programs in child protection um, from workshops, one day workshops, half day workshops, right through to 12 month diplomas. Child Matters also works um, a lot in the policy area, child protection policy, working with government and organisations, um, making sure that um, children are safe in their organisations. What's the history of Buddy Day? How did it all begin? So Buddy Day started in 2011 and um, in partnership with Well Energy Trust, Mark Ingalls. Had, we had a conversation, he was very interested in holding a community event to um, raise awareness of child abuse and um, keeping children safe. So we, we really um, started off with a partnership. They provided funding and resources for us to hold this event. Um, it was a community event the first year, which um, driven by Child Matters, and in 2012 then we um, took over running it um, alone. Um, the event, as I say, the third year in Hamilton, so it's really well known in Hamilton. People, buddies just appear everywhere, um, and people are just talking. I, I don't think you could go anywhere in Hamilton on Buddy Day without seeing buddies somewhere. Um, we had some amazing stories. I mean, buddies have captured people's imagination. It's, it's just they're just crazy. We've had buddies all over New Zealand flying in Air New Zealand, people booking a seat and for their buddy next to them on the plane, to the um, person standing up and speaking on the um, intercom to the um, people in the plane as it, as it was taking off about Buddy Day, having his buddy there. Um, the CEO of Sovereign um, took his buddy to Melbourne and was presenting at an international conference and had his buddy on the stage and, was, and spoke about Buddy Day and their involvement in Buddy Day. We had Buddy Day and Westpac, Buddies in Westpac helicopters. Um, we had, um, they were at musicals, they were bungee jumping. Um, yeah, Kerry Suter um, won the ultra mar marathon in Coromandel with a buddy strapped to his back. So, like, buddies just, people get a buddy and they just come up with these amazing ideas. And of course, it all raises awareness of what we're trying to do. And what is your team's vision for Buddy Day in our country? We started with one location in Hamilton and this year four, three extra um, key locations. So we would love to see it grow. How, and how that looks, we don't know at this point, but definitely um, we have a formula that is working and um, we will stick with that. So tell us about your website and what's available on there. www.buddyday.org.nz has all the information you need to know about Buddy Day. So whether you want to be involved as a creator, or if you're a school, a carer to adopt a buddy on the day, a cafe that wants to be involved on the day, or if you'd love to be a sponsor, please go to our website and contact us there. Um, the childmatters.org.nz website has all the information you need to know of what to do and where to go if you have concerns about a child. For more information or to see videos of celebrities with their buddies, visit buddyday.org.nz. Coming up next, welcoming in Christmas with The Road to Bethlehem. Welcome back. Christmas is just 21 sleeps away and The Road to Bethlehem is opening to the public next Sunday. The event is running from the 15th to the 18th of December at the Seventh Day Adventist School on Moffat Road in Tauranga. I spoke with Pastor Pat Downey to hear more about this year's journey. What The Road to Bethlehem is about is to portray the real reason for the season of Christmas and that is uh, from the story of Matthew chapter 1 and 2, the scriptures, that Jesus is the Messiah and that he came to give us a renewed hope and to make it a family tradition for the communities. And what can people expect if they come along to the Road to Bethlehem? What are we going to see when we turn up on the day? What they're going to see is uh, entertainment from uh, the Salvation Army Band and uh, 
a crowd of people wondering, queuing at a gate wondering what's next. It's actually a tour. Road to Bethlehem is a tour uh, and they run through every uh, seven to ten minutes with a group of about 80 people and they have guides and they will see uh, uh, the Annunciation scene, they'll go through a, uh, a real market scene and out into the uh, field where they'll see King Herod is wanting to, uh, to kill this baby and wants to uh, say initially to worship but really his uh, motive is to kill and of course then we come into a uh, scene where the, uh, the shepherds have uh, seen a sign and uh, they follow the star to, uh, to the final scene, which is really worth seeing. Well, it sounds very cool. And are there many different aspects um, this year that haven't perhaps been seen in previous years? We're always trying to uh, make a few small changes. Uh, we keep closely to the script as much as we can, to the, the scriptures of Matthew 1 and 2, but we're always making changes. And this year, uh, one of our major changes is that uh, everyone gets a ticket, but this year they actually get a passport and uh, that is something new we've been introduced this year. Mm, wow. And how many people have you seen come through in previous years? Has it been a very big sort of uh, event? Yeah, well, it's actually uh, blown us away, really, because the first year we did it was 2009, and we didn't know what to expect, and uh, we worked on 2,000 people, and uh, I think it was 2,000 we worked on, and we got uh, close on 3,000 people and it's grown every year since then. Oh, that's fantastic. Now tell us about the logistics of the day. So I guess parking and what times the shows run. Yeah, there is parking on the school grounds and we have attendants in place to, uh, that are identified to, uh, to park cars and to help people that uh, uh, may have disabilities with the wheelchairs and stuff like that. And also uh, our shows start at 6.30 every night. The gates open at 6.00 and the first show starts at 6.30 and uh, the final show starts at 9.30 at night. The best time to see uh, Road to Bethlehem is uh, after 8, between 8 and 9 o'clock at night. And how many people have you had working on the Road to Bethlehem this year, I guess in the scenes, behind, behind the scenes and then also performing uh, in the show? We have a, have a staff of 200 plus. They're all volunteers, they're all uh, Christians or other folk that are interested in helping us. Uh, we have a couple of other churches, uh, the Grace Community Church and also uh, Bethlehem Community Church and other Christians from throughout the city. Um, everyone that uh, comes along is just so passionate about uh, sharing the story and uh, just excited to be there. We've been uh, operating since February this year, the Road to Bethlehem Committee, and uh, we start planning in February uh, for the event hap to happen in December of that year. And who funds the Road to Bethlehem? Funding is, uh, we've got um, funding this year from New Zealand Christian Foundation, from uh, the North New Zealand Conference of the Seventh Adventist Church in Auckland, and also the local uh, Tauranga Seventh Adventist Church. And how much work goes into the Road to Bethlehem each year? When do you sort of start your planning and start the setup and that sort of thing? Uh, the setup starts uh, this weekend uh, for this year, which is uh, December 8th. We all start putting up tents, but the actual event, we put it up, most of it on the day, on the 15th we'll be putting it up. Uh, but the planning goes on uh, year after year, trying to uh, improve in a few areas to make it attractive for folk to come every year. Sounds like a very big job. So what makes it all worth it uh, at the end? Well, what makes it really worthwhile is that we're showing the, the real story of the season, that Jesus is the reason for the season, and, uh, and people are just so passionate, and to see that uh, the children, how they see uh, in that final scene that uh, it's a real baby, and, uh, and the choir at the, far, at the last scene, it's just awesome. Everyone just, uh, there's an atmosphere that just lifts people, and uh, people go away um, saying, wow, must do that again. And what would you say to people who may have never been to something like this before or may feel a bit apprehensive about going along um, to a sort of like a Christian thing? Uh, how would you encourage those people to come and check it out? I'd say come and have a look. Uh, most people that have seen it uh, are just so ecstatic that we can pull it off and it's only by God's grace that we can do that. Um, but it's an amazing scene and, and, and people that do come say uh, uh, that was different. And we, we have people that have come to our church because of that, and others are actually asking the question, you know, why? Why was Jesus born? And he came to give us a chance at life, and he actually came as to give us an opportunity for eternal life. 
And that's, that's really why we do, do the program, to show that Jesus is so loving, he's so caring, and uh, that he would come as a babe and he would die on that cross that he would give us eternal life. And finally, if we want to find out more or have a look at those times again, where can we go? You can go to our website, which is uh, www.roadtobethlehem.org.nz, or you can, uh, uh, advertising is on uh, billboards throughout uh, Tauranga, and also uh, there's some leaflets here if you'd like to uh, partake of some of those. Make sure that you visit the Road to Bethlehem this year with family and friends as part of your Christmas celebrations. Coming up next, preparing for dry weather this summer. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. After last year's dry summer, there has been much discussion about how farmers can be better prepared for another hot summer this year. Hillary caught up with Federated Farmers Waikato member Stu Wadey to hear some tips about how to prepare. This is the second part of the interview. Welcome to the show. Now, uh, many farmers in the Waikato are looking into water storage ponds in the wake of the drought. Yes, irrigation is, 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 is in vogue, especially in the South Island and some dry parts of the North Island. When you talk of ponds now, there is uh, regulations that are set down by the regulatory authorities. So when you do a pond, it's got to be constructed, that it's engineered, that it won't collapse and then it, it'll hold water and also hold sediment and all the environment environmental issues with it. What we, uh, what the problem we do have, of course, is that if we want to uh, do a, to do a good size dam and have a community scheme then you have to go through the Resource Management Act and be a notified problem, uh, a notified uh, situation. And we have a lot of issues where a lot of people are opposing uh, us damming water, citing uh, environmental issues. Don't, I don't decry, environmental issues are important, but also we've got to consider the economic uh, values, not only for the farming community, but also for New Zealand, because primary product, product brings in a lot of um, much needed cash into New Zealand. So if a farmer was to have um, a water storage system on their site, what's the environmental issues that could be brought uh, um, the, the, the issues are taking away habit, habitat for flora and fauna more than leaching. Because we, when, you, when you trap uh, pure fresh water, you have very little uh, concern with uh, nutrient leaching. The, all the issues are about flora and fauna. Yes, we must look after them, but I am sure if we could be sit down and radically talk out these, these issues, we can actually have a win-win. But at the moment, uh, most of the issues are flora and fauna. I'll bring in the Ruotanifa situation down in the lower north, uh, northeast of um, the east coast of... Uh, of, of uh, Hawke's Bay. Hawke's Bay, yeah. yeah. The Ruotanifa uh, dam. Um, th th yeah, that's, that would bring in, a, it's been proven to be a very economic uh, situation to do, supported by the regional council. They have to go through a regional consent process. It's being opposed on environmental issues. 95% of that fresh water flowed out to sea. And I'm sure if we can sit down, we can have a benefit for that region for the farmers there, for the community, because when you have a buoyant uh, farming community, you have employment opportunities. So you've got a win-win-win if we could water store. But at the moment, we have a lot of opposition to that. Well, should then farmers be looking at using more individual um, storages for themselves, like doing a pond on your own property for yourself? It, it all comes down to cost-benefit analysis. If you can get, you in a, in a locality with about 30, 40 farmers, when we have an ideal location that we can actually trap water to this point that it fills up, then you go back to natural flow. So you've got, you've got a stream going through a gully. You trap it, yes, you restrict the flow to fill it up, but once it's filled up, it flows the natural flow. So we, and so that can give probably 35, 40 days of a community uh, uh, irrigation scheme because you're looking at the cost. You're looking at the engineering requirements to build a dam. You're looking at all the costs and, and it, it will not work for individuals. It's got to be community-based. 
But dairy farming's already had a massive impact on our the uh, purity of our rivers. I mean, you know, do, oh, is that, that even more? Oh, we're, we're down to science now. Uh, we kn we know that uh, years ago, uh, late 1980s, we had this buds word sustainability. Since the late 1980s, we have improved our. our, our our water, our water nutrient uh, pollution. It was, I don't deny, we had processing factories uh, processing meat, putting all their straight blood straight into the streams. We, we know that. That doesn't happen anymore. Our dairy factories have been are far better managing their byproducts now. We have one dairy factory in the Waikato that pulls water out of a water source upstream and puts back water of a better quality downstream. So, so we've got some good stories with our processing facilities. We have some good stories on nutrient leaching since the 1980s, which I don't deny at that point was not good. It is better now. And we, uh, that's why we have, do got a lot of, lot of support to, to go further, but we have to do consider the uh, nitrogen leaching and the, and the phosphate leaching. There's no two ways about that. Do you think then that water storage should be enforced on those who are more at risk? We, it, farmers would love to be enforced to do water storage. That means you have to have statute that will override the Resource Management Act. That will not happen and I don't want it to happen really because we need to have a buy-in from all communities, whether it's urban and rural, that will benefit all. We know in our area how much employment opportunities there are from the rural sector, not just on the farm, but the tanker drivers, the processors, the laboratory people. If we can uh, improve our production levels, it will benefit the whole community. But getting back to the point of, of being sustainable, we have to buy in. So I don't think we'll be enforced, but we've got to have a better situation there. The economic comes into it, as well as the cultural and the, the social and the, and the, the environment. Is there, um, do you think there is a possibility of us ever having that balance? Yes, it's got to go forward. You know, we're 9.5 billion population predicted in 2050. We're seven, just over 7 billion now. If we don't improve our food production ability in New Zealand, history shows you world countries fight over food. So we've got to be far more efficient than we are now. We're looking for our 12 year olds to be 50% better than we are in production of land. In, Ch in Japan, it, it is figured that, that the small farms over there, their, their next generations are going to be 70% more efficient and productive in 2050. That is the news for today. We really enjoy your feedback, so like us on Facebook or email us at news at tvcentral.co.nz. Join us again tomorrow night as we hear about what's been happening in the Bay of Plenty and we pay a special visit to a class at Firth Primary School. I'm Harriet Wilson, have a lovely evening. Been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.